Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives this afternoon for Elizabeth Cobb, um, program on Elizabeth Cobb's book, The Hello Girls, America's First Women Soldiers. Whether you're here in the McGowan Theater or watching us on YouTube, uh, thank you for joining us, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN viewers. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up next week in this theater. On Tuesday, May 2nd at noon, author Adrian Miller will be here to tell us about his new book, The President's Kitchen Cabinet, the stories of the Afri African Americans who have fed our first families. He chronicles the stories of the African Americans who worked in the presidential food service as chefs, personal cooks, butlers, stewards, and servers for every first family since George and Martha Washington. The next day, May 3rd at noon, in this is the national book launch for JFK, A Vision of America. JFK's nephew, Stephen Kennedy Smith, and historian Doug Brinkley bring together Kennedy's greatest speeches along with essays by America's leading historians, political thinkers, and writers and artists. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar events in print or at archives.gov. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. After the United States entered World War I, women as well as men eagerly volunteered to serve their country. Although women were prohibited from joining the regular Army or Navy, they found ways to contribute, often taking up jobs once performed by men now going overseas. One group of women, however, possessed a skill much needed by the Army. Fighting a war required reliable a reliable communications network, but more than two and a half years of war had devastated the French telephone system. General John J. Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Forces, called upon the expertise of women telephone operators. More than 1,700 women applied, and just over 200 served in Europe with the Army. Their service is documented in their official personnel files, now in the National Archives at St. Louis, a collection of archival civilian personnel records. Yes, that's civilian personnel records. After the war, these women, because they were women, were not deemed eligible for military benefits despite their Army service. It took until the 1970s for the Hello Girls to finally receive the benefits due them as the first female Army veterans. In both our military and civilian personnel record centers, we preserve the records of millions of men and women who have served our country. Throughout this centennial ob observance, the National Archives is showcasing its unparalleled World War I holdings and the stories contained in them, including those of Pershing's Hello Girls. To, to find out more about Hello Girls and their place in World War I, we turn to Elizabeth Cobbs. Dr. Cobbs is a historian, novelist, and documentary filmmaker. She holds the Melbourne Glasscock Chair in American History at Texas A&M and is a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. In addition to The Hello Girl, she's the author of The Hamilton Affair, a novel, and American Umpire, which became the basis for her first film and debuted last year on American public television. Her works have won the Alan Nevins Prize, the Bernath Book Prize, and the San Diego Book Award. She's written for the New York Times, Jerusalem Post, Los Angeles Times, National Public Radio, and Reuters. She has also served on the Historical Advisory Committee of the U.S. State Department and the jury for the Pulitzer Prize in History. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Cobb. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I'm just utterly delighted to see all of you, and I'm incredibly thrilled and honored to be here. I was telling the archivist of the United States I am his biggest fan. I have spent many years in the National Archives, bent over a desk, hunched, you know, uh, creating books out of the wonderful treasures that our archives contain. And, and they're treasures that are, that are so important, not only because they're collecting all the things that we know are important, but they, they collect everything. And the things that we don't know are important. 
And we don't know them sometimes yet because it takes historians 100 years later to say, that's what is important. In the long run of time, that was the thing we need to know about. But unless the archivists are in a daily way collecting and preserving these records for, for decades, if not centuries, you know, we won't have that opportunity. So the book I'm going to tell you about today is a book, I think it was a three for one book. I'm always selling books, of course. So it's a three for one because it tells you something about World War I. Why were we in that war? How did we fight it in the way they did, the way that we did? What was the significance of it? And it's also a book that talks about another subject that, that came at the same time historically, which is the vote for women. So why did that coincide with that? And then it also tells you the story of an absolutely remarkable, funny, interesting, plucky group of young women who were America's first women soldiers. So World War I is important because and in some ways it's, it's really the start of the 21st, 20th century, I should say. Which century are we in? The tw I'm in the archives. I get confused easily when I'm here. So uh, it's the start of the 20th century really defines it. Uh, World War I, one of the most important things it does is it takes the great empires that have really governed humans for much of human history, thousands of years, and it shakes them and, and runs cracks right under them. The great empires fall apart. What replaces them? Nations, nation states, the Ottoman, ultimately the British, the French, etc. It's also the first time in human history where we really get the destructive potential of the marvelous new technologies that we've invented. World War I is that, is that war where that happens and we suddenly realize, wow, things that we thought were just all good <laughs> can actually be quite destructive. And lastly, World War I is the time that women really get full citizenship. And the gender revolution that you know, reaches up to us today in many ways really begins there. And in fact, women become soldiers before they become voters. And that's not a coincidence. So what I'd like to do is just tell you how this story unfolded. Um, I hope I'll inspire you to read the book at your library or wherever, get the book. Um, so I'd like to begin talking about suffrage, women's suffrage, because that's kind of the backdrop to this. And women's suffrage was a fight that had been going on for decades, for 70 years. And some suffragists said that they felt that they were in a rut that just kept getting deeper with time. Uh, and, and there were a lot of reasons why people opposed women's suffrage, and I have a whole PowerPoint here to give you images to go with this. Uh, this shows that this was a worldwide movement. This is a picture of Emmeline Pankhurst, very famous British suffragist. Now, there were women fighting for the vote all around the world, but the British uh, movement was quite, pre um, quite preeminent. And you see her standing here literally in front of the British lion. And that's not, in some ways, it's, that's a, a good image because one of the reasons why men and, and women, too, had opposed a vote for women is not only did they think it would make women less feminine, but they were also concerned that, in a way, it would make nations into sissies, too. That if you had a world of wars, you didn't want swooning damsels, you know, out there making these kinds of decisions. And so for Emmeline Pankhurst to stand in front of the British lion was saying, I can tame that lion. <laughs> so uh, she, of course, uh, very famously, or some would say infamously, began the pr uh, a program of civil disobedience. So women were arrested. They broke windows. They... You know, they were terrorists in a way, I mean, not to the point of taking life, but um, they actually caused some damage and they went to prison for it. Uh, and they wanted to go to prison for it. So this really is the first kind of mass demonstration movement of civil disobedience at the start of the 20th century, which we so often associate with African American civil rights, which is of course true and important. And it's also interesting to understand the ways in which women were also using civil disobedience. Uh, this, of course, spread also to the United States. I shouldn't say spread, <laughs> because actually women's suffrage starts here. The crazy thing is that we're one of the first, the first, and we're also one of the last to give women the vote. Now, isn't that weird? How do you explain that? There is a, an interesting explanation for it. So this is the first women's march on Washington. And uh, we, of course, had one here in Washington just several months ago. Um, but this was, uh, took place at the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson, who had opposed women's suffrage. In fact, he said it gave him a kind of a chilled, scandalized feeling when he saw a woman speaking in public 
<clears throat> as I'm doing right now. <laughs> he, he would think that that was just you know, kind of you know, very inappropriate. And he thought that the kind of woman, as he put it, the kind of woman who would support women's suffrage was just completely abhorrent. And he would never, ever support the vote for women. And that's why women turned out to, to demonstrate against his and to alert him as he was coming on into the presidency that they expected something better and something more. So, so women had, in the United States, uh, put forward the idea of the vote for women since 1848. It was the most controversial by the way, of all the demands of the feminists, the vote was the most controversial. Now you have to think about why is that? And a part of this is that some of the things that were on that list of demands were things that men could give women. They could do for women. They could do be a better job of protecting women. But to give a person a vote is like saying they're a person and they might decide differently from you. It's a, it's a, it's a, a true expression of individualism. So uh, the United States also, uh, women began to do civil disobedience. This is a picture of Doris Stevens. She was age 56 at the time. She had just gotten out of prison, was uh, strapped to a chair, force-fed with a tube down her throat. Uh, she wrote the great American classic, uh, Jailed for Freedom. And uh, so she was one of these women who was, who was trying to make a difference. But the other reason why people like Woodrow Wilson and many men, and again, many women, opposed the vote for women, was the idea that the republic belongs to you. You are like a shareholder, one might say, in the republic, if you are willing to defend the republic with your own life. And that's, in fact, how the vote had originally spread in the United States, was that when our country was first founded, you had to have property qualifications to vote. You had to own a certain amount of property. But in the revolution and after the revolution, Men without property said, I held this musket for my country. How dare you deny me the right to vote? And so the vote spread to propertyless white men. And after the Civil War, when African American men had stood up with a musket and with a gun to, to defend their country, to claim their country, they too, you know, the vote ultimately got the vote and actually fairly quickly got the vote. But women couldn't fight. So, you know, it was kind of a non starter until the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and the Industrial Revolution changes the terms of fighting for men and for women. So you can have, you know, pipsqueaks like Harry Truman. No, <laughs> he wasn't that short. But uh, he was in World War I as an artillery officer. So guns and the ability and the kinds of jobs that the Industrial Revolution created changed the calculus quite a bit. And one of the things they did is that they created new technologies that had already brought women out of the home and at which women were especially good. In World War I, there was only one technology that the United States actually had an edge in over its rivals. The United States did not, unlike today, the United States was no arsenal for democracy, let me tell you. The United States sent iron and food and blood and muscle and bone men to France uh, to fight in World War I uh, and other parts of the globe, but primarily, in primarily on the Western Front, because it did not have the facilities to make guns and planes and tanks and even trucks on the scale that were being made in France at the time. But there was one thing that the United States was particularly good at, and that was telecommunications. Now, this particular um, picture I'm showing you is a World War I poster you know, trying to recruit men to operate telegraphs, telephones, and radios. And the, the size of the font on the radio makes you think it's important. <laughs> but in fact, uh, the primary instrument of generalship in World War I was the telephone. Now, of course, it had been invented in the United States by Alexander Graham Bell, who, like many great Americans, was an immigrant. And, uh, and he came from Scotland and invented the telephone over here. And it, it was superior at this time than these other technologies because, first of all, the telegraph, I mean, imagine this, right? Telegraph is Morse code. So somebody has to take the message sitting at a desk. They have to type it up. They have to send it to somebody, a courier who takes it to someone else. So it's slow and it's centralized. The other technology was the radio. That sounds good, right? But radios at this time were so heavy that it took three mules to lug a radio set out into the field. Plus, radios are insecure. And somebody could uh, take the, the, air, you know, the radio wave out of the air. They could figure out where it was being beamed from and then go bomb that place. 
So radios weren't so good either. Plus, radios at this time did not yet carry human voices uh, or, or music either. I mean, they carry, it was a Morse code uh, system as well. So the telephone was the one instrument where anybody at any time could immediately communicate in language, spoken language with someone else. And so it was used by everybody, invented in the United States, but used everywhere in World War I. Um, so this picture, uh, by the way, shows you German soldiers behind the lines. Now they're looking up over the barrier, perhaps trying to decide, do we uh, you know, storm or do we retreat? And what's the guy on the left doing? He's on the telephone. <laughs> Isn't that such a familiar gesture, by the way? You know, I could go like this and we would all know what I was doing, right? Talking on the telephone. Um, by the way, the Japanese also fought in World War I as well. And on the left-hand side, you see the men trying to decide, is it time to fire yet? And the fellow on the right is on the telephone. Is it time to fire yet? So the telephone was the means by which the major commands of World War I were given on a front that spanned hundreds of miles. So to get requisitions for supplies, to tell people to pull back, go forward, you know, cease fire, et cetera, that all worked really well. Now that worked really well, actually, as long as you could get a connection, as long as your call did not drop. Well, this is where uh, women come in, but before I, quite before I get that, I want to say the Americans also, the, U, the United States came late to the war, and one of the things we brought along with us, the, the most advanced technology we brought was the really the most up-to-date telephone technology. So this is actually a picture of American doughboys, and that's the name for um, infantry soldiers in World War I. They were called not GIs, they were called doughboys. And this shows you um, doughboys who are actually Pacific Bell AT&T employees. Because before the United States was on a kind of permanent war footing, which we really have been since 1947, the United States became kind of policeman to the world. Before that, the United States never had any standing army. So how, do you, how does it work? You know, if you have an, uh, you know, war is declared, the next day you're at war. So the United States had a procedure um, often, you know, in an impromptu way, drawing upon industry. And so even before the war started, you know, they could see it coming. And so they contacted AT&T and they sat down and they said, Look, how are we going to do this? So they formed what were called the Bell Battalions and they took men who in their day-to-day -day lives worked together and took them up wholesale over to France to do things like, this is from the Battle of the Somme, S-O-M-M-E. I'm sorry, I'm a professor, so I spelled things out. I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, okay, you get it. You're not taking notes. Uh, the Battle of the Somme, the great uh, important war of, um, for the British, especially of World War I. And you see them running telephone lines in there. This uh, next picture shows you men under gas attack repairing the wires. So think of the heroism, think of the courage that that took. You know, maybe with bombs are flying all around you, running through the trenches, running through these great craters that, lit that littered the um, side, um, you know, the uh, territory of northern France, and jumping in and out of them and fixing the lines. But as I said, this, you know, there's, that's the hardware, right? And that's you know, how the, the uh, uh, signal gets transmitted. But you also had to have somebody transmitting it. Now, the Army did not like the idea of using women. They did not like it. And on the left-hand side, you see um, Secretary, of the, uh, Secretary of War, as he was then called. That was the title at the time, Newton Baker. And he so disliked the idea of using women, possibly as telephone operators even at home on American military bases, that he did not want to build toilets for them. Now, because they might stay long enough to have to use them, right? Uh, and so, by the way, that's something I learned here at the National Archives. You know, I'm over at College Park in that case, going through that, and I'm reading Newton Baker, you know, no toilets, and I just, you know, it's that, it's that wonderful detail that you don't get without, a, you know, an organization like our, our wonderful, our, the wonderful treasure that the National Archives is. So on to, to the right side, that's General Black Jack Pershing. Now, Black Jack Pershing was the American uh, commander of American Expeditionary Forces in France in World War I. And uh, he had a rather different attitude than Baker. Now, Baker, remember, is sitting here in Washington, D.C. You know, it's pretty safe. Pershing is out there on the front line. Now, Pershing had had the experience before of serving alongside soldiers 
that were in a way non-traditional soldiers. Uh, he got the, the name Black Jack because he led what were known as the Buffalo Soldiers, African American soldiers on the American frontier. And he had praised them, their valor and their abilities um, when he got back. And some of the uh, a little uppity cadets at West Point had sort of taken offense at that and had given him the, the nickname, which they thought was not uh, a compliment, Black Jack. Um, but he, he continued, you know, that was his name all the way up through, um, up through the ranks, his nickname. Anyway, he was a person who appreciated a soldier who could be at his side in a time of need and for that person to be the best person to do that job. And I think that's one reason why he basically said to Newton, uh, pardon me, Newton Baker, you know, we've got to have women. Now, by the way, the Army is a little slow on this. As I said, really what they wanted was they wanted women to do the traditional things, as did Woodrow Wilson, that women had always done. So, you know, whether you were knitting for the Red Cross on the far left or canning food on the, up, up the poster up above or down below, selling moms selling Liberty Loans or women being nurses, these were the things that they were used to. Yet even so... And this is a curious thing to me that I don't still fully understand, even have, after having written a book about it. Why the Navy and the Marines felt rather differently about this than did the Army. And in fact, um, so you know, this was the classic idea that you know, there would be an occasional woman like Joan of Arc, you know, and that, of course she's only employed to sell war bonds in the case of the American Army. Um, but the Marines and the Navy had a rather different attitude. And in March of 1917, so a bit more than now than 100 years ago, the Secretary of the Navy, whose wife was a suffragist, FYI, um, he, he said, you know, we, we, we built this new Navy. We're in the midst of a big naval buildup to respond to what's happening in World War I. They didn't have enough soldiers. So he asked his own counsel, can we, um, can we bring women on? And the counsel said, well, there's nothing in the legislation that says you can't. And so they immediately recruited women and ultimately recruited and used, employed, um, inducted 11,000 women in both the Marines, and this is the poster for the Marines, of course, but also for the United States Navy. They paid them the same as men doing the same jobs. And even though the press started to call them yeomanettes, making them sound like, well, it's really, you know, it's just a girly thing to do anyhow, he said, they are yeomen, and that, <laughs> that is their rank. So he was kind of funny about that. He insisted quite correctly to, on calling them yeomen. By the way, the British, right almost in the same month, began recruiting women as well. Now, the British had been at war for three years by this point. So um, they had already been using women in a lot of different capacities. In fact, they had a group of women that were called munitionettes. Again, that sort of feeling like, you know, so it doesn't look too out of sync with femininity. They would add this E-T-T-E -E on it. And uh, so they had these munitionettes. They were also called the Canary Girls. And they were called the Canary Girls because the toxic chemicals that they had to deal with were so strong that they turned their skin yellow. And so that's why they were known as the Canary Girls. But they also uh, started a women's group that was called the WAX, Women's Auxiliary Corps, Army Auxiliary Corps. Uh, and they used them not in combat, but in France, uh, sometimes under bombardment. In fact, some of them died that way. Uh, to do a variety of kinds of jobs, including telephone operating, but digging graves, you know, running railroads, all kinds of things. So the Army knew that, in a way, they would have to ultimately respond. They did not want to bring in women, as did the, Army, as did the Navy and the Marines. But the, the Industrial Revolution kind of wouldn't let them have their way, basically. Because this is a civilian uh, uh, exchange. Now, by the way, if you've got your glasses on or just really great eyesight, which I don't have after having spent so much time in the archives, just saying it's hard on the eyes. Uh, at the very back of the room, you'll see men supervising the women, supervising the women, uh, because you know you couldn't just have women doing that. Uh, but it was a really it was a female-dominated occupation, and it was a very, very taxing, very high-speed occupation. Um, the women were taking calls for information. They were giving out the time. They were uh, checking back to see if somebody was still on the line. They were handling hundreds of calls per hour, um, actually literally talking with people. This was a period of time in which the telephone had no dial. It's what they call a candlestick phone. And if you can kind of imagine this, it looked like a, a big black candlestick. And so a caller would simply lift up the receiver and speak into 
you know, the, the mouthpiece and the operator would say, you know, hello. And that's why they ended up being called hello girls um, and, you know, a number please. And they were very, very well trained. It was a very tough job. It was also, by the way, one of the highest paid jobs women could have. School teacher was next. And that's about it. <laughs> we just got to the top of the ladder right then and there. So the army decided finally that it would simply have to recruit women. And it was Pershing himself who sent uh, a telegram on November 8th in 1917 saying, we have to have women. You need to put them in uniform. Uh, you need to get an officer to supervise them. And you need to get them over here as soon as possible. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that, by the way, one of which is that that, uh, well, first of all, it was a very high-speed occupation, very demanding. Um, there were a lot of pressure on you. Uh, the people who were calling you would be yelling at you and barking at you. This is wartime, too, so it gets worse, and they're swearing at you. And they said, and they said that the women had better nerves than the men. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? You know, you think, well, women can't be in war because you know, they have those frail nerves. They said the women have better nerves for this, you know. They, you know, they can be t having people bark at them, and they don't collapse. They, they just keep plugging, whereas the guys are like, you know, yeah, right. No, I'm not, you know. Uh, they would b back talk. The men did. So, um, so the women were very good at it. The other thing is, as uh, the archivist said, the, the lines in France were, um, many of them had been bombed, had been bombed out, but also the lines were not very clear. They weren't the latest technology. The United States had something like 70% of all the phones in the world. France had 2% at this time. So the density of the phone network, the clarity of the phone network was very different here. And so they not only had to be able to um, you know, use this system well, but they also had to interface with French operators because the United States ultimately, in the course of less than a year, built an entirely new telephone network for France. You know, I mean, the, the parts that would serve this military purposes and over to England as well. But until that happened, you had to have what were called, uh, you know, local operators basically talking with what were known as toll operators. Uh, I'm sure there are probably some people in this room who actually even maybe have operated this technology. I've given this talk a couple of places, and people say, I was a telephone operator. So a, a, a trunk line is like me calling you, right? Now, a toll call is me calling you, you and, and through you calling somebody else again. And the toll operators were like the, the people who uh, managed the hub. Now, in France, before they got this entirely American line up, that meant that the local operator had to speak to a French operator. They had to parlez vous. And most doughboys did not parlez vous. <laughs> so they had to get bilingual American women who could handle this job. In other words, they began recruiting women not because they were as good as men. Otherwise, you just would use men. But because, at least at this job, they were better than men. And that's the only way that the Army would have considered uh, inducting women. So, um, so they began to, and they, you know, this was one of the first posters. This shows you the YMCA, YWCA, I should say. Actually, it took care of the women's billeting, you know, developed their places for them to stay in France. Again, this is that public-private uh, connection that you see throughout World War I. I mean, are you aware, for example, that the, the United States government um, expropriated or basically took over the telephone wires and the railroads in the United States for the duration of the war as well? So a lot of private enterprise was just you know, put to the service of government because our government was relatively small and had no experience in an ongoing kind of military effort of this sort overseas especially. So the YWCA was in charge of that. And the women were recruited from everywhere, and they came from everywhere. Um, as uh, the archivist was saying, 7,600 women applied for the first 100 jobs. The greatest number came from my home state, California. By the way, Californians are very chatty. And, and there was, <laughs> there was the part of this is that the telephone was especially important in parts of the world, uh, parts of the country, where there's not a lot of population density. So you need a phone to communicate with people um, if, if you're very far away from people. So actually, a lot of the operators came from the West. In some ways, it seems surprising, and in other ways, very it makes a lot of sense. So this was a group of women. As you see, Joan of Arc is riding alongside them, since this is the only, the last time they saw a woman in uniform. <laughs> and, uh, and they say, we are on our way to France to serve our country. And I think they might even have said it a little differently, to serve our country, because it was their country, too. And that's what these women wanted to show, is that they were willing to put their lives on the line for their country. 
Uh, this is one of the first groups, and in fact, the woman who's uh, second from the right-hand side, she's sort of looking up. This is Grace Banker, who was a 25-year-old uh, college graduate from Barnard College in New York City, and who one week didn't know if she was even, they were even going to return her letter, and five days later was the chief uh, operator for the entire U.S. Army effort, <laughs> the American Expeditionary Forces, because you didn't have women soldiers. If you didn't have soldiers, it means you also didn't have women officers. So they had to, they had to very quickly figure out, okay, in this group, who can become an officer of this group? So Grace Banker and some others, you know, they were a few of them were college-educated women, and they became, uh, they became the first. Uh, the first officers. They trained, by the way, on the rooftop of AT&T in New York City. Uh, and by the way, this was uh, January, February, March. So it was pretty cold on top of one of the very tallest buildings in New York City. But they thought, this will prepare you for France. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out really well. Uh, this is when they actually got to France. Grace Banker sits in the very front of that uh, the trio of women there. And by the way, again, you'd have to, you'd have, to have almost a, a, your mic... Uh, magnifying glass to see this, but about half of the women are actually looking up. They're not looking at the camera. Their, their eyes are turned towards the sky. Well, they had been bombed the night before. So I'm just thinking that might be the reason why they're still looking at the sky. Uh, this is when the German army advanced so close to Paris. So this is, in, um, this is in 1918. And it looks like Germany will win the war. In fact, the British say our backs are against the wall. The French army has mutinies going on, and the American women arrive in that context. Uh, and, and France itself is under bombardment from the giant German cannons, which are now advanced so close to Paris that they can reach, they can reach Paris itself. And the women were thrilled to be there. That's exactly where they wanted to be. After this, they were sent off to various parts of France. Most served well behind the lines, as did most men in World War I. Uh, about 1.5 million men were actually on the front lines, the firing lines at some point. Uh, another 2.5 million were either here in the United States or ser serving in what were called the services of supply in France. Most of the women served well behind the lines too. Uh, but there were some that General Pershing felt he had to have with him. And so anywhere that Pershing himself would go, as close as he got to the action, uh, those women were there. Um, and there was a group of six women in particular who, was, who were, in a sense, his staff who went with him. And in fact, at one point, I read the diary of one of them, and this, of course, the great adventure of doing research is finding cool stuff that nobody else has seen, really. And this one operator, she's on the phone one morning, and Pershing yelps in her ear. She says, sir, what happened? He said, oh, a shell just whizzed past my ear. Now, she was sitting about 50 yards away from him. He was in his, um, his little railroad car, which is what he used as his office his private office. So this is a picture of a barracks that were in Neuf Chateau, France. Uh, the corner was taken off the a barracks at one point by a German bomb. Uh, this shows two sisters. They were naughty women, I have to say. Some of these girls were actually kind of, <laughs> they were such scamps. Uh, this is Louise and um, Louise and Ramon Le Breton. Uh, Ramon, who's on our right, was 16, and Louise was 18. And the army thought they were 23 and 21. <laughs> in fact, the Army officers said they're awfully mature for 21 and 23-year-olds. <laughs> but they, you know, they were Franco-Americans. They were immigrants, and they felt they, they really wanted to be a part of this. They didn't want to see this happen, see their the, uh, homeland of their parents uh, go under. And by the way, you might notice that in the upper right is the same poster I showed you previously, the poster of Joan of Arc. So we know that they were inspired um, by these posters uh, in their work. This shows you a picture that is um, on our far right here. This you can't see her face, but this is Grace Banker sitting next to Tootsie. Well, her name was Esther, but everybody called her Tootsie. Tootsie Fresnel in the middle and on the far left, Bertha Hunt. And I was able to, just very great fortune to find the diaries of two of these three women. And uh, this is the, them at the Battle of San Miguel. There were two major offensives that the United States led in World War I, the Battle of San Miguel, and the US also had an offensive at Muzargan, which is right near Verdun at the end of the war. And um, this is at San Miguel. After this engagement, when the women, the, you know, the, and this had been going on for a while, because the women actually were often fairly close to the front, that their, the concussions from the guns would shake their switchboards. You know, and so they would, you know, the windows would be rattling. In Paris at one point, the windows went out 
from, from the concussion of a bomb. And some men came in, soldiers came in to take the women out and said, you've got to evacuate now. And they said, we will leave when the last one of you does. So similarly, these women were at Sami Hill, and that was a very short battle after three days. At the end of it, uh, they saw General Pershing on the street, and he was a very, uh, you know, I mean, he treated every soldier like a soldier. And, um, you know, he came up to the women, and they saluted him, and he saluted them back. By the way, the British women were not allowed to be saluted, just to tell you something. That's interesting, isn't it? So the British idea was that the women really weren't really quite yet army. So the women, um, you know, saluted him back, and he said, ladies, you know, I don't know what he called them, but you know, how, how is it going? Is there anything else you need? And they said, everything's just going wonderfully, General Pershing. All we would like to do is to be as close to the front as possible. So he turned to his adjutant and he said, take them where they want to go. So um, after this, they were at the Battle of Musargon for quite a long time. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, back at home, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson is having a little bit of a problem because uh, he does oppose women's suffrage, and the women's suffrage movement really now is picking up steam. And uh, there were women picketing outside the White House, as, we, as you probably know, uh, for uh, more than a year, uh, and saying, President Wilson is deceiving the world when he appears to be as the prophet of democracy. President Wilson has opposed those who demand democracy for this country. So they were pointing out his hypocrisy. Now, by the way, historians, we love to point out hypocrisy. It's like what we just get up in the morning for is to point out American hypocrisy. But I think of that, I think we, we, we're a bit mistaken sometimes when we think that's a bad thing. It's actually a creative catalyst. It has been since the beginning of our country. When Thomas Jefferson said all men are created equal, he was a slave owner. But he also said, I tremble for my country when I realize that God is just and his justice will not sleep forever. So those hypocrisies are part of what change us. We see them, you know, people reflect them. We look in a mirror and that helps us change and helps us grow and helps us improve as a country. So this is what the women were doing. Woodrow Wilson did get the message, by the way, and I don't think it was just them who were changing his mind. Uh, uh, partly it was an electoral issue. It was a midterm election and he was starting to realize that, you know, that women were gonna vote for his opponents. Uh, if he did not give them the vote. And he also began to realize that women were, were fuller people than he had realized. And so he spoke to the U.S. Senate, and he said, and, and also, by the way, now, by this time, a dozen and more other countries have passed the vote for women, including Germany, including Austria, including Bolshevik Russia, <laughs> including Great Britain. So the United States is starting to look kind of bad. And he says, are we alone to refuse to learn the lesson we cannot isolate our thought or action in such a matter from the thought of the rest of the world. We must either conform or resign the leadership of liberal minds to others. And so he came out on behalf of women's suffrage. Um, the women, of course, immediately took this up. President Wilson says it is time to grant suffrage, but it did not happen before that uh, fateful moment of the midterm elections. And so when Woodrow Wilson went to France, he went to France knowing that, um, that the people who were coming into office would be people who did not support his international programs, people like Henry Cabot Lodge, for example. And then back in France, uh, the battle is still underway, the battle, not just the battle for the vote. But one of the things that was so interesting to me about writing this book was to learn about how men supported women too. And this is a story about men and women working together for justice, men and women trying to learn how to actually work together, live alongside each other, have that be something where they could count on each other in the most dire of circumstances to be there, uh, to, be, to be forthright, to be honest, to, to fulfill their duty. And, uh, and they also learned how to have a good time. <laughs> so this is a group of our young women uh, sitting at a table. They're celebrating a birthday with uh, a, a general, a brigadier general, um, colonels, majors, but on the basis of, of the camaraderie that comes from people who've risked their lives together in an important cause. Once the war was over, I'm trying to get my little thing to advance here. Come on. Oh, well, I could just describe these pictures. I don't know. We'll go backwards. We'll see if that works. No. Not going forward either. Oh, dear. Hello. Well, okay. I'm sure that our technical crew is going to figure this out. So while they work on that, let me just tell you. So what happens is that the war, of course, is, is just about this point about to wind down. Nobody knows that. They think the war is going to continue for another 
uh, almost year. They think it'll, it'll go into 1919. Um, but in fact, of course, the war does come to an end uh, with the armistice on November 11th um, of 1918. And so what happens at that point uh, is that the women are recognized. In fact, Grace Banker, and I hope to be able yet to show you this beautiful picture that I got from her granddaughter, uh, which a picture of when she had the Distinguished Service Medal. So the Distinguished Service Medal was the Army's highest honor uh, at that time. Uh, the distinguished, uh, uh, there was another one for being in battle, but the DSM was for people who had served um, in officer capacity, and there were 16,000 officers in the U.S. Signal Corps who qualified for that medal, of which 18 were given out, 18 out of 16,000. And I sat here in the, in the hall of the, of the National Archives reading out that list of 18 names, and it begins with General so-and-so and goes down to Colonel so-and-so and ends up with Miss Grace Banker, because that's the only rank for a woman at that time was Miss. So Grace Banker won that uh, wonderful award. Um, unfortunately, Woodrow Wilson did not have as good a luck. Uh, he got back only to find out that his plan for world peace would not be signed by the U.S. government. Oh, good. We're getting some advancement here. This is excellent. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you this one picture. Um, at one point, um, this is towards the end of the war, what happens is that the the barracks, the offices in which the women are working, are set afire by a, by a German prisoner of war who knocks over an oil, um, an oil uh, heater of some sort. The barracks go up in flames. The women are actually had just moved their switchboards next door, just a short distance away. But they're, all of their belongings, their barracks are burned to the ground. And the building in which they are connecting the army, in which they are sending out commands to the army, which is arrayed on this vast front, the, the biggest killing battle in American history, the Battle of Moose are gone. More men die there than any other single battle in American history. And the, and the general who commands this uh, as the head of the Signal Corps, he says, if the Army loses communications for an hour, the whole war machine will collapse. So these women are in this uh, barracks that is filling up with smoke. And finally, the Army comes and says, OK, you've got to get out. And they pull their boards, and the women go out the door. Well, fortunately, they manage to save the building. And half an hour later, the women go in, and the Army picks back up. And the women continue to connect, um, to continue, continue to connect the uh, the fields and the with the the fighting men with the headquarters. Not all of them made it home. This is Inez Crittenden of San Francisco. She died of influenza in France. Um, influenza was actually the single biggest killer of World War One. Uh, was a pandemic that swept the world and killed millions of people at that time. Uh, she she got she got sick while well, she was buried on the day of the armistice. So she made it almost to the end. Um, Oh, and this is Grace Banker with her Distinguished Service Medal. I told you you had to see this picture. Isn't she gorgeous? <laughs> and I got this from her granddaughter, so that was even better. Um, Woodrow Wilson, as I said, his, thing, his war did not turn out quite as well as Grace Banker's. Uh, this shows Louise and Raymond, my scampish uh, young women, after the war. Um, and uh, by the way, the Hello Girls stay, came before and stayed longer than most doughboys. Um, many of them were there for as long as two years. I mean, some of them were there as long as two years. Um, most for well more than a year, and most of the doorboys came and went back. And that why? Because of logistics. How are you going to get people there, and how are you going to get them home? You need communications the whole time. And in fact, the other woman who died uh, in this period of time died well after the armistice and well after Woodrow Wilson came back, even from the Paris Peace Conference. So um, that, those are uh, uh, Louise and Raymond Le Breton. I wanted to say just about this, that when they got home, Bell Telephone welcomed them home. The women came back expecting a hero's welcome. They found something rather different. It turned out uh, that unlike the Navy and the Marines, which gave women full veterans benefits, including hospitalization, including war risk if they died, war risk insurance, um, including a flag on their coffins, including a bonus, all the things, the benefits that came to, to veterans after the war, the Army did not do so. The Army told the women that they'd only been contract employees. The women said, well, wait, I never signed a contract. And the Army said, you were contract employees. And in fact, as I followed the story all the way up to the 1970s, there was one point in the 1930s where the Army said, you didn't even sign the oath. If they had gone to the National Archives in St. Louis and opened up any of these personnel records, they would have seen you know, hundreds of oaths that these women had taken and had signed to serve their country to the end. And, uh, and so when they got home, they were very disappointed. And one of the women, she was just the kind of person who just was not going to take that lying down. 
And for the next 60 years, little did she know that it would take all of those years and everything she had, but that she would eventually triumph. And this is Merle Egan on the left. Now again, this story is so much about what women did, but it's also about the men who believed in justice and who were there for them as much as they possibly could stand in their shoes to, to support them in this. And actually, it's the second wave of feminism, which now catches up with our heroines. And uh, Mark Ho on the right, who was a young Seattle attorney, helped Merle Egan on the left, who ran, by the way, the switchboard for the Versailles Peace Conference. And, um, and together, they petitioned Congress, and with the help of the National Organization for Women and Barry Goldwater, who are not usually in the same sentence, uh, <laughs> they, they got this legislation through Congress. So to conclude, and she, by the way, she said uh, at, the, at the ceremony, which I can show you next, um, she said, I deserve my victory medal, and I'm so glad I, I'm getting it. And I deserve it not only for serving in World War I, but for fighting the US Army for 60 years and winning. <laughs> so when I thought about writing this book, um, you know, I, I, this is my seventh book, and so you're always going to scratch around what is going to be your next book. And, uh, and I thought that I'd be writing really about the past. And, uh, and I thought, well, this is interesting. I've never written a book about women, and that, that maybe now is the time. And as I said, I, I thought it was about the past, and then I discovered that I was actually writing about the present. Because in 2016, during a, a presidential race that could have elected the first woman president, she was not elected, but, you know, and said history, in a sense, that, that uh, moment in history did not happen. But what also happened in 2016 is that the Army decided that women could no longer, women who served in World War II could no longer be buried at Arlington. Now these were the same women who had gotten in on the legislation as the World War, I, World War I women went through on the same bill in Congress, those two groups of women who had not been honored. Now these, the World War I women are now all gone, but the World War II women, there were still a couple left. And last year, you know, her, the family of one wanted to bury her at Arlington, and the Army said, you weren't real soldiers. Now these were women pilots who had towed targets for other people to take target practice at in World War I. I mean, these were women's uh, service pilots. And, uh, and so Congress once again had to pass new legislation to saying, no, actually, these women really are, really were soldiers. So I, I always feel like history gives us comfort and courage to face the present. It's, uh, and, and it also tells us that progress is never just a straight line. It's always a little back and forth that there's always resistance against reform. Um, but it's inspiring. Uh, I think it tells us that women and men of courage fought to make our world a better place, and that we have to continue to do so as well. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. And if you ask a question, which I'd love, um, I'd be so delighted, please use the microphones because C-SPAN is filming this and they'll want to get you, or at least your question, on television. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Cornelia Weiss and I thank you very much for this fabulous presentation and I also appreciate you bringing out uh, the Arlington burial because the policy was that they could be buried and then all of a sudden the Army decided that they couldn't. So going back to burials, so there's a, there's a cemetery at Musargon and I'm wondering, the two women that you talked about who, who died, um, I'm assuming, over in France, were they buried there or were they buried at any other military cemetery? Thank you. Yes, um, a great question. One of the women uh, was buried right outside Paris. Um, so she was buried in one of the Paris cemeteries. There are you know, so many cemeteries in France for World War I. It's such a tragic war. Uh, the other woman was buried initially in that same uh, cemetery right outside Paris because she was behind the lines, um, but uh, her family asked her to be brought home. And so she was brought home, she and other deceased soldiers. So this was this weird thing, by the way. They kept calling them soldiers, and they kept talking about their discharge. They had army insignia. They had regular army uniforms. And actually, it was their uniform that ended up being the crucial piece of evidence because did you know it's illegal to impersonate an officer? <laughs> or a military person. So by wearing the uniform, by giving these women these uniform and treating them as soldiers, they had made them soldiers. Other questions? I, 
I really enjoyed watching the series The Great War by PBS Experience, American Experience. And in it, they stated that um, the Germans had tapped the lines throughout the entire war. Um, so how did these women get around the Germans tapping the lines? <laughs> and they knew everything that we were doing before we did it because they tapped the lines. <laughs> Right. Well, the women knew when the lines were being tapped. You know, they could say they had been trained. Now, by the way, of course, also keep in mind, would you put civilians in, tar in charge of your most intense military secrets? I mean, these were women who could hear everything that was going on on every call. Uh, and so they could hear if a, if a line had been tapped, it went a little dull. And so that was part of their job was to be alert to that. They also had to speak in code. And they had all these kind of crazy codes that were constantly changing, Wabash and Willow and you know, Jam and Uncle, and they would have all these codes that would change very, uh, very rapidly. In fact, one of the problems at the, the time when their um, headquarters was destroyed or partially destroyed, um, they, they couldn't tell the other women elsewhere why they hadn't been answering their calls for the last half hour, and they were not happy with them. Because the problem is if, if you could tap a line, then you could, dis, you could uh, deduce um, who, um, where the general staff might be. And so they had to be always very alert to this kind of problem of, of listening for that, being aware of it. Any other questions? Well, I, I hope you'll get to know the Hello Girls. They fought so hard for their story. And they fought so hard to keep their story going until it could be acknowledged finally by our government. And the National Archives made that possible. <laughs> so I, I do hope you will get the book and read it and, and enjoy it as much as I enjoyed learning it myself. Thank you. <laughs>